This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Our first speaker is going to be Jeremy and he's going to be talking about village halls, leisure and community in early 20th century England. So what we'll have is we'll have each the two papers and then we'll have questions at the end for both speakers. Okay, so. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dion, and many thanks for inviting me to give this paper. It's, it's very, very nice to, um, to be here. So... Um, what I'm going to talk about isn't quite what was in the abstract um, for today's paper, in case anybody's looked at it, because I thought afterwards that it'd be better to actually talk about new stuff rather than the, a lot of the stuff in the abstract was stuff that I'd kind of done before. And it suddenly occurred to me that you might actually have read some of my things and maybe even somebody else possibly could have done. So <laughs> be better to do the new stuff. Um, so, But I will touch on the themes that I, I mentioned in the, in the abstract. So I want to begin by saying something about what a village hall actually is, which turns out to be a tricky question. Then I want to say something about the chronology of hall provision, which will a bit revise my published opinions. Um, and then something about who, who provided them. Uh, and then something about which kind of gets towards my title, something about the role of community in relation to, to village halls. So, all right, what is a, a village hall? Well, there are lots of related um, forms. So um, this is um, a rather magnificent um, church institute, um, Marcham uh, in Berkshire, and I have to say I really wish I had one of those terracotta lions in my garden. They're, they're, <laughs> they're fine creatures, I think. <laughs> um, but so there, are, so there are church halls and rooms, there are parish halls, there are institutes, there are reading rooms, there are community centres. Um, uh, all of those are different in interesting ways, I think, from village halls. And then there are also a whole lot of what I call sectional halls, which is halls which relate to a particular kind of organisation. So this is, I'm rather fond of this one, um, this is Courage Women's Institute Hut. Um, hut rather than a hall in Berkshire. Um, it's probably an ex um, World War One army hut um, made out of corrugated iron. Um, there were loads and loads of huts like that on the on on the market quite cheaply. Uh, now falling to pieces and, and and being knocked down. So this is a threatened a threatened species. Um, this is, but also there were British Legion huts and scout and guide huts. There were sports pavilions which served many of the same functions as village halls. Um, in larger villages, although mainly in towns, there were Masonic, Temperance, Friendly Society halls. So there's a this is a this is a, the village hall is a particular kind of instance of a wider kind of family. In theory, I think the definition of a village hall as opposed to these other kind of halls is rather clear. It has of course to be a hall rather than a room and it has to be under public rather than either private or sectional control. In practice it's a bit more difficult. So this is Victory Hall at Farley Hill also in Berkshire where most of my examples come from simply because I was asked to write something about Berkshire village halls so I did some extra research on that. Now the National Council of Social Service which was responsible in part for chan channeling funds towards British Hall um, construction and, and upgrading, had great difficulty in deciding whether this building really was a village hall. If it wasn't a village hall, it was not eligible for funding. So on the one hand, it had always been referred to as a hall, a village hall. Secondly, it was used by the whole community. But conversely, it was actually technically a licensed club and you can see it has a little bit the appearance perhaps of a you know i don't know what a sports pavilion or a, or a club perhaps and crucially the management committee was elected from the club's members rather than being representative of the whole village so the, there are there are there are you know so that was a, a tricky issue for the the ncss now you might well ask does it really matter whether a hall is a village hall or a parish hall or or, or a British Legion Hall or whatever it may be. I won't talk about that now because I don't really have time, but if people are interested, uh, we can discuss it in um, afterwards. I, I think under so, some circumstances it matters quite a lot, um, but in other circumstances probably rather less. So let's talk a bit about the numbers of village halls. And again, this sort of slightly revises um, <coughs> some of my published views. Um, there's no national data of any value from before the late 20th century. So we have to fall back on county level data. The Oxfordshire Rural Community Council, the ORCC, um, did a survey of 
I think it was 37 villages around Oxford, and it found that I think 24 of them had halls, so that's about 65%. Um, conversely, Warwickshire Rural Community Council found that only 35% of the um, villages in its larger sample, 172 villages, had halls by 1939, having said which another 30% had sectional halls of some kind. Wiltshire appears to have been somewhat similar to Warwickshire, although we know nothing about the breakdown between the sectional halls and the village halls. So Wiltshire has 65% of villages um, with halls of some sort in the 1940s, and that's Bracey's. Bracey did a fantastic survey of social provision in, in rural Wiltshire. Um, uh, and my, my research on Berkshire, and I'm reasonably confident of this figure, that, that I, I don't think I can have missed many, many halls because, um, well, uh, because um, th there aren't many places where there really could be halls where I, I haven't looked to see if, if there are, is that about 38% of parishes in Berkshire had village halls by 1939. On the face of it, that looks rather similar to Warwickshire and quite possibly to Wiltshire. Having said which, um, we're bedeviled by the distinction between parishes and villages, and of course uh, there are parishes which have no village, and conversely there are also parishes which have more than one village in them. Um, on the whole, I think there are probably rather more parishes than villages in Berkshire, so the figures need to be adjusted slightly for that. But So my best guess is that, oh, and I should say, I should comment on that, because what, what it looks like from these figures um, is that it looks as if Oxfordshire is the outlier um, here, that 65% of, of Oxfordshire villages in that sample had halls. But Actually, on the whole, I'm inclined to think that the, the real figure, the sort of real 1939 figure, is probably closer to about a third of, of villages um, having halls because Oxfordshire was exceptional. The Oxfordshire Rural Community Council was the earliest and the most dynamic of the rural community councils, and it played a large role in extending halls um, in the area around Oxford. And I, on the whole, although this is just a hunch on my part, I suspect that uh, villages which were close to a kind of centre like Oxford were probably rather more likely to have halls. And th this survey was of villages right around Oxford. So I suspect that 65% is significantly too high. So I would, but it's, I mean, actually, of course, as always, we need more research. And it's only when people have done, you know, when other people, <laughs> I hope, <laughs> have done what I've done for Berkshire. <laughs> Maybe I'm not going to have to do the whole country, but um, uh, uh, you know, then we will actually be in a position to, to really say. So this is just just my my hunch at the moment. Um, let's go on. Um, so um, a bit more detail on on Berkshire um, then. Um, so um, you can see here from the the, the the map what I've what I've found. Um, I'll just say a little bit about my sources um, for this um, before I, I comment more on the the map. Um, so it's very bitty and miscellaneous. There's no single good source, which it's like so many things, isn't it? That, you know, we wish there was a single survey where you could just go to it and it would tell you the answer. But it's not like that with village halls, I can tell you. I mean, not least because no one really knows what they are, but, but even if they did, you, it's still not like that. So I've looked at, you know, a whole range of things. I've looked at directories, of course, um, you know, Kelly's and whatnot. I've looked centrally as well, the records of the National Council of Social Service, which are quite useful. Um, uh, the, by far the most useful single source I found or not really a single source is actually interestingly the Reading um, local studies um, library and it's the what um, my old supervisor Ted Collins uh, when I was at the Rural History Centre years ago used to call the grey literature which is kind of those little pamphlets which you sometimes find on sale in kind of you know churches and this kind of thing really obscure things but there's masses of data in these things I mean obviously you need to be a bit careful about what the quality is it's not necessarily kind of um, the, the most impeccable um, in terms of the, the depth of research that's gone into it but there's masses of data for this kind of local study so I got far more out of these obscure little kind of guides um, in, uh, than, than anything else actually um, local newspapers of course um, the archives of the um, Berkshire doesn't didn't have a rural community council until much later but there is now a community council for Berkshire so their archives are somewhat helpful the Victoria County history, various other secondary sources. So just basically a whole hodgepodge of stuff. But what I got from it was 173 um, village halls um, in Berkshire, taking the whole period right up to, I think I think the research I did was about 2007. So that's about, um, so it's a few years out of date now, I'm afraid, but there won't be much change since then. So what I found um, was that um, 
if you just look at halls with known opening dates, because of course for a lot of halls, I know they were there, <laughs> but I don't know when they were opened. I can tell you when they must have been opened by, because I've got my source which says there is a hall in, you know, Beenham or whatever it may be, but I can't tell you exactly when it's open. So just, but to get a, I think to get a kind of accurate indicator, what we need is halls where we, where, where we actually know the opening date. So of the halls with known opening dates, um, 25 were constructed between 1880 and 1913. Um, I'll, I'll run through the significance of this in a moment. So 25 between 1880 and 1913. That means that equates to seven per decade. Um, 36 between 1914 and 1939, my second period. And that's a massive leap, and I'll come back to that. That's 14 per decade, so double the rate of hall provision in the period um, between 1914 and 1939. 29 between 1940 and 1975, which is eight per decade, so pretty much back down to the rate between before the First World War. And then 16 between 1976 and 2007, that's five per decade. And how I interpret the kind of last period, 1976 to um, 2007, is that, what, what do economists call it when an innovation has kind of reached sort of saturation points? So that's what I mean anyway, that really pretty much we're getting to the point where pretty much every village which conceivably could have a village hall does have by the late 20th century. Um, and in fact, when I looked at the few villages in Berkshire which didn't have halls, I found that they had very good substitutes. So interestingly, um, Great Coxwell is one of the villages um, that doesn't have a, um, a hall. Now, does Great Coxwell, does the name Great Coxwell mean anything to any of you? You see, we don't have medievalists here, do we? <laughs> Unfortunately. It has arguably England's most majestic tithe barn. Um, stunning, stunning building. Um, William Morris was very, very kind of keen on it. Um, and they use it as a, a rather grand village hall. Um, uh, as I hope to, to show you, village halls, I do think, have a, a sort of distinctive and, and interesting architecture of their own. But um, Great Coxwell is something else. So the, the few examples turn out to have um, good substitutes of that, of that well... <laughs> Not like Great Coxwell Tithe Barn, but, you know, it's a sports pavilion or it's some other kind of thing which we'll do instead as a village hall. So, yeah, so we've we, we've reached kind of the completion, as it were, of the process by the late 20th century. So um, I want to say a bit about um, why the number of halls leaps up so dramatically in the period after the First World War. Now, I suppose the first thing I want to want to say is that I, 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 I mean my views about village halls have changed in all sorts of ways since the since the things I published I, mean, I still by and large stand by um, what I and my first article on village halls was 1999 so it's quite a while ago now and I've done various other things since but um, but one of the ways in which my views have changed is that I'd now as so often happens with when you do more research, doesn't it? That what looks like a revolution gets kind of smoothed out um, as you as you do more research. And so, I had initially thought that there were really very very few halls before the First World War. I'm now aware that actually there were quite a number. Um, having said that, the big surge after the First World War still very much survives. And in fact, if I were to break that kind of interwar period down into 1920s versus 1930s, I think it would look even more dramatic because there's little doubt in my mind that the rate of hall provision kind of slows quite considerably in the 1930s. So I think there is a sharp spike in the 1920s. So the revolution is still there, but I think we need to be, you know, a bit like the Industrial Revolution or something like that. We need to be more aware of the kind of prehistory um, here than I certainly was initially. Um, so that's one way in which uh, my, my views have, have changed, I suppose. Um, and actually, conversely, there's more of a tail at the other end as well. There are more halls being created later than I'd initially realised. Um, so, but, but still, as I say, I think that kind of big surge after the First World War is still there and still very important. So I want to talk a bit about where that comes from and also how far that represents a kind of significant change from what was happening before. And I want to look at this in terms of outside influences and then a sort of... Um, uh, the local local level and I think these these two things kind of come together in some ways so in terms of where the external impetus to provide village halls came from and there were very important external um, impetuses we need to start in Oxford I think and um, with with um, 
see if I can go on to there we are these two um, people remarkable people the, these two um, WGS Adams the warden who became warden of all souls um, very interesting and I think uh, underrated kind of figure in many many respects um, and um, Grace Haddo a, a very remarkable um, woman um, she, Grace Haddo was vice principal of the National Federation of Women's Institutes um, later became principal of St Anne's um, College and it was Adams who set up Oxford's first I suppose Institute of Social Work you might call it a place called Barnet House which Mark knows um, all about and and, and, um, uh, and so Adams was instrumental in setting up Barnet House of course as a memorial to kind of Canon, um, Canon Barnet of the settlement uh, movement um, and it was set up actually just before the First World War but the First World War kind of completely disrupted plans for Barnet House and after the war Adams and one or two other people but Adams, Adams was the key driver here decided that Barnet House should be um, repurposed uh, this is rather controversial really because I don't think Canon Barnet himself would have approved of this if he'd still been around but um, Adams thought it should be repurposed um, so that it would focus principally on rural problems Adams was very close to um, Lloyd George and, and, and shared some of Lloyd George's um, ruralist interests, interest in the land, for example. But more particularly, Adams was a disciple, and I think that's the, the right word in this context, of Sir Horace Plunkett, um, the, the great Irish or Anglo-Irish cooperator. So I think Adams saw an opportunity. So rural matters were very close to, to Adams's heart, and I think he saw an opportunity here. And he... Uh, um, he, he pulled his levers and got Grace Haddo appointed as secretary of Barnet House. And from that position, um, Grace Haddo decided that it was necessary to set up a kind of coordinating organisation to pull together the proliferation of voluntary organisations which were working in the countryside just after the war, I mean, a whole lot of them, um, uh, uh, and to, to coordinate their, the, their efforts and to, to, li to liaise between the voluntary sector and the statutory sector. And this was where the idea of rural community councils came from, and Oxfordshire Rural Community Council was the first one which Haddo set up in 19, 1920. And Adams and Haddo worked very, very closely and I think very effectively together. And they came to the conclusion that the main barrier to the further development of social and community life in the countryside was the absence of um, of anywhere for, for for that life to take place in so uh, interesting isn't it really I mean uh, you know how important are buildings um, in terms of social life in terms of in terms of kind of intangible things like kind of culture um, well you know there are interesting arguments there I think but Adams and Haddo I, I think rightly actually came to the conclusion that there really wasn't a lot that they they, they, they really knew about the countryside they got vast experience both of them um, and I think they were broadly right that not a lot was going to happen without a space in which it could happen. The more so is, of course, it has to happen in the countryside during the winter, um, really, because you've got the long summer evenings, but then you're, by and large, kind of out, kind of working um, in the fields or whatever. So they thought village halls were essential, um, and they were instrumental in establishing um, something called the Village Halls Loan Fund, which was established by the National Council of Social Service in 1924. Now, Adams was actually chair of the National Council of Social Service at this point. So he was a man on lots of committees and in, in, in powerful positions. And the Village, Hall, Village Halls Loan Fund was that the source for the funding was the development um, commission. So again, I think the link with the Lloyd George, in a sense, is, is there again. From 1930, as well as offering loans for the construction of village halls, um, the National Council of Social Service was able to offer grants, um, and that came through from the Carnegie UK Trust. So um, that's how that works. Um, I should add that to, to add to this picture of a sort of institutional network between the government, the Development Commission, um, and the Carnegie UK Trust, and the National Council of Social Service. I need to add in the rural community councils, which had um, that there wasn't one in every county, um, but they'd spread across many counties by this point. So the National Council of Social Service used rural community councils where they existed to 
um, administer its grants as a kind of as a, as a sort of node of communication um, with the with the villages, I suppose. So we've got this striking three-way partnership, I think, very interesting between the voluntary sector, um, uh, the state, and U.S. philanthropy, um, and this is how many village halls are funded. So by 1938, um, the National Council of Social Service had funded um, 449 village hall schemes, grants, uh, sorry, grants and loans, in 406 villages. Very hard to estimate how what proportion of all village halls that was, since, as I've said, we've no idea how many there were nationally. But my guess is that's possibly somewhere between 10% and 30% of all village halls. So it's very significant. But again, this is another respect in which I'm slightly revising my views. Further research has persuaded me that actually, although the contribution of the National Council of Social Service and of those other organisations was very, very important, and not just in financial ways, actually, um, it was less decisive than I had originally imagined. It's a typical example of how we're prisoners of the archives, that you go and look at the sources which survive, and that persuades you that this is what's happened, whereas actually it's more complicated than that. Um, I should say that the contribution, the role of the National Council of Social Service, and behind it the, the, the Development Commission and the Carnegie Trust, was I think especially important, however, um, it may not have been decisive taking the, the the wider picture but I think it was very important in the case of smaller villages like Tainton here in Oxfordshire which had a population of just 185 in 1938 and was built with a Carnegie UK Trust grant um, in, in that year um, so they could never have found the funding I think um, had it not been through um, through this grant so that's the kind of that's the sort of from above aspect that's the sort of a very brief sketch of, of, of some of that um, I want to go on to talk about the local um, level as well because by and large the development commission the Carnegie Trust um, uh, etc the rural community councils were responsive rather than proactive in establishing village halls I think all of them believed very much in the significance of local initiative and local effort so there had to be a local initiative um, for, for this for this kind of funding to come on stream. And as we've seen, probably in most villages, actually, it, it was not done that way. So where did the initiative on the ground come from? Well, the obvious place to look is with landowners, and undoubtedly they were very important. Most village halls before the First World War, I think, were initiated by landowners, and the land was provided by the landowners and they were paid for by landowners and some of the pre-first world war village halls are really remarkable they're they're grandiose buildings some of them this i think is is the kind i don't know what to call it it's a sort of buckingham palace of village halls really this is nettle bed in in oxfordshire 1913 it was built by robert fleming um who bought the joyce grove estate um in 1903 uh, built a grand mansion there and all sorts of things in the village um, and then built this this village hall as part of a, a wider program of estate estate improvement. So I'll just show you the plan of the hall. You probably can barely see that, but most most um, uh, does it show up the little um, cursor? No, it doesn't. But you can see where the hall is um, at the top. I mean, that's that that bit at the top where it says hall is that that's what most village halls consist of. But Nettlebed has a play shed rather delightfully. Uh, it'd be nice to think this was for the children, but I think it was actually the, 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 the men who were playing skittles in the, in the play shed, unfortunately. Um, and it has a rifle range, interesting given the date. Um, it actually has loos, which must have been a, a comfort, I'm sure, a library, a reading room, a billiard table, um, a cookery school it's got the lot it, it really is um, it is it is um, a magnificent building but it cost four thousand four hundred and twenty pounds which is an awful lot of money um, I think that the typical village hall was more like somewhere about sort of 250 kind of 300 perhaps 400 pounds um, so a magnificent place after the first world war landowners continued to provide land for village halls but they um, less often seem to have actually initiated hall provision um, and they also much less often paid the cost of the actual construction. So the way I would interpret this is that landowners in many, many respects are withdrawing from an active paternalistic role in village life. They're selling up a lot of land, so they've got less, literally they've got less at stake 
um, in, in the villages. There's that famous statistic, which is probably roughly right, that a quarter of the land in England changed hands in the years after the, um, in 1918 to 21. So I think landowners don't want to spend so much um, in villages at this this point that, that they've not got as much at stake as I say but but and, and land itself certainly after 1921 is a declining asset in the countryside it's the, the the value of land falls quite steeply so although giving land is still generous it's not necessarily costing landowners quite as much as it would have done before so um, that's roughly how I'd interpret that I think increasingly what we get after the um, First World War is non-landowners, kind of wealthy businessmen, um, those sorts of people, kind of who who still continue to provide um, to pay for hall construction. Um, so, a good example would be the Pinder Hall at Cookham, which was constructed in 1936 by um, um, Henry Pinder Brown, um, who was a wealthy solicitor. So, this is this is the, in memory of his wife. Um, but the main driving force, I think, after the First World War is really popular pressure. So, it's, it is much more coming from from below, I think. Um, so. This is Stouting um, in East Kent, population under 200. Um, now the villagers wanted to build a, um, a hall in commemoration of um, peace. They rejected an ex, a sort of um, um, corrugated iron ex-army hut of the, the sort of kind that we saw at the Courage Women's Institute. And they used their own labor um, uh, to build the hall. The only paid worker was the um, Thatcher, who thatched the roof, the only village hall I've come across with a thatched roof. It sadly lack, it doesn't have it anymore. But um, uh, the Women's Institute did a lot of the the work, provided the refreshments inevitably. And I believe that these um, charming blue and white curtains are actually WI um, creations. So, um, and memorial halls were, of course, quite quite significant. Although, as um, as Nick Mansfield has shown. They were very controversial um, because they were seen by especially the wealthy as too utilitarian uh, so, and, and therefore not sufficiently worthy to commemorate the, 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 the fallen. Um, for Berkshire, memorial halls are about 15% of the total, so again they're significant but not critical. Um, uh, I'll come on to Holton the Moor, which is a fascinating place in just a moment. I want to say something now about village halls and citizenship. I'm getting towards kind of community, but um, citizenship is a, a crucial element because um, there was a whole nexus of ideas which people like Haddo and Adams were interested in, and which I've written about elsewhere, between the village, the concept of community, um, the, the notion of citizenship, and the rise of democracy in this period. So. Um, and, and this is kind of influenced as well by, there are lots of things which feed into this. It's influenced by historical writing about the kind of ancient village community. So people like Maine and Seabohm and, and Gom who wrote about the, the village community. Um, also influential, I think, was the kind of Whig history um, school of thought. People like Freeman and John Richard Green emphasising that the Anglo-Saxons were a distinctively freedom-loving people and that... Um, they had democratic institutions, or allegedly democratic institutions such as the Moot and the Witten. And it was widely thought that this could serve as a kind of model for a, a sort of revived village community, a sort of revived community of, of, of democratic <laughs> citizens in the modern age. So, and the terminology, I think the word, it's, the village hall itself as a term is quite interesting because there are faint kind of Anglo-Saxon connotations um, about it. I mean, as opposed to, for example, community centre, which has totally different connotations. And this is a really lovely example. This is Holton Lamore Moot Hall in, in Lincolnshire, um, again, 1910, built by the Reverend Thomas George Dixon, um, who was um, an antiquarian and local historian, also an arts and crafts enthusiast. Um, and he apparently, so, so um, Richard Olney has researched this hall, but um, apparently um, uh, Dixon believed that the Anglo-Saxon period had been a kind of golden age of democratic um, local government. You can probably just faintly make out the kind of um, vine scrolls either side of the, um, the, the doorway and the window. And that comes from, that's, that's biblical, that's taken from Micah, um, uh, chapter 4, verse 14, a celebrated um, verse um, it, the, the relevant part of it is under his own vine and fig tree um, and that was a, um, a, a, 
a, um, a biblical quotation which was frequently invoked by radicals in the 19th century who were arguing for land provision for the notion of a sort of independent peasant proprietorship. So there's a very interesting political kind of reference here. So, that, so the suggestion is that what Dixon wants here is not just a kind of purely political expression of community, but it should ideally, he would hope, have, have those economic roots as well. Um, so I better better um, whiz on. Um, um, the National Council of Social Service um, and the Rural Community Councils, influenced, I think, by um, by Plunkett here, especially, regarded village halls also as a means not just to create this kind of democratic um, village community. Um, I think they like the idea, particularly of the kind of face to face, of the sort of and people. They actually talk. People like Haddo actually talk about the sort of classical model, the sort of Athenian model of sort of face-to-face -face democracy. So the idea is you can't have that in the town. For, for a lot of these people who are involved with this, the towns are a lost cause in every sense. Um, and democracy just can't really happen in the towns. That's not really conceivable. The village, it might still work. So the village is the sort of last remaining hope. But as going together with that, it's not at all just a political project. It's, it's sort of deeper than that, because it's very much about a revival of village culture and the notion that there is or should be or can be an authentic village culture, something which is distinctively rural. So Plunkett writes about a new rural civilization, and halls are a sort of the central part of that in many respects. And this I think is why cultural activities such as village drama, music, local history, um, even village museums are so important in connection with village halls. Um, so, and similarly, um, I'll move on because I'm really running out of time now, but um, similarly, I think it's why there is such an emphasis upon vernacular building materials and building traditions. So this is the Morris Memorial Hall in Kelmscott, um, uh, designed by the well-known arts and crafts architect, Ernest Gimson. And as you will see, it's built out of Cotswold stone and in, in very much a kind of vernacular Cotswold style. It's got um, stone tile um, roof. So villages which applied for National Council of Social Service funding um, had to get their plans approved by a panel of RIBA architects um, who frequently insisted upon the use of local building materials or local styles. Um, and um, Tainton, which we looked at earlier, is an interesting example that there the National Council of Social Service forced the villagers um, to roof the building with shingles, um, wooden shingles, as opposed to asbestos, which they thought was more, you know, they thought the wood was more vernacular, I suppose. Um, and here's another um, example. So I'm nearly, nearly finishing now, Dion, so I'm not going to overrun too hopelessly, I think. <laughs> this is the Chichester um, Hall at Whitley um, in Surrey, dating from 1935. Um, uh, this must be close to the sort of ideal village hall, I think, from, from many people's point of view, because it is set so much in, in this kind of um, glowing countryside. Um, but from our point of view, what's important about it, I suppose, is again the vernacular style, the kind of tile hung wall which faces us you can't really see but beneath that there is half timbering and then very much the kind of you know um, Surrey Sussex kind of um, vernacular tradition of having having the very kind of um, what's the word um, the, the, the very big roof going down very low kind of big gable this is, this is very much kind of trying to be local and vernacular in its in its style and of course very emphatically rural as opposed to urban but really, I want to finish with um, this magnificent place. Well, I say I say finish. I will very quickly flick through a, f a few a few slides um, after this. But this is Wood Green Village Hall, remarkable place in Hampshire. Um, the hall was built in 1931, uh, but the murals by Edward Payne and Robert Baker are 1932 to um, three, and it was funded again by the well, ultimately funded by the Carnegie Trust through the National Council of Social Service. Um, so, and I think this really, these, these, these extraordinary murals really express the, the vision, I suppose, of revived rural community um, and rural self-sufficiency, which was at the heart of what certainly many of the external actors um, wanted. The interesting question, which I don't really have time to talk about, about how far the kind of villages themselves wanted to be rural um, in, this, in this sense. Um, but um, so... Um, here you can see um, people returning from um, 
uh, the, the fields. I'm not quite sure what they've been doing. These are really hay rakes, but um, actually what's going on here is cider making. Um, I, I, we can see in more detail in, a, uh, in the next slide. Um, so this is a cider press. Um, so this is obviously kind of autumn. So I don't quite know what they've been doing with their hay rakes. The interesting thing to me here is that this woman is very swarthy and probably a gypsy, you would have thought. So that says interesting things about um, uh, the inclusion of apparent outsiders. Um, and this is a, sorry? Could it be hops? It might be, mightn't it? That would make sense, the trailing thing. That, that's very interesting, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, outsiders, these are poachers. I think that's rather an interesting kind of, again, sort of the village is down here, so you can't see it because my cursor, but the village is just by the far bend in the river. Um, New Forest ponies, uh, wood green is in the New Forest, and, and also you've got um, Scots pines, which is a very New Forest kind of thing. But again, interesting sense of this is the Sunday school so again where children fit into the the community I think is intriguing um, and this is um, the horticultural um, show with of course scouts in um, uh, prominent evidence so there's a whole vision of a certain um, nexus of village institutions and of what constitutes the kind of ideal sort of um, uh, self-contained um, village community so just very briefly then to conclude, um, uh, I think that um, the halls are very complex and, and variable. There are, there, are, there are lots of different kind of um, people involved in their creation with lots of different motivations. But an important strand, I think, an important and influential strand is the notion that village halls could express, enrich and consolidate distinctive village identities, distinctively rural village identities and cultures. And I think a legacy of this, which we, we, we can still see today, is the prominence where funding constraints allowed, because they frequently didn't, um, of local building materials and architectural idioms. Um, and sometimes also very rich expressions um, of uh, artistic expressions of shared community life in, in places like um, in, in places like Wood Green. Um, so um, really it seems to me that village halls are much more diverse and much more interesting architecturally than has perhaps been recognised. You, you look in Pevsner and you won't find them, I can tell you. <laughs> Maybe in some of the updated Pevsners, but um, they're, they're, they're underappreciated. Ironically, I think in a sense because they continue too much in use, they're not seen as part of history. In most cases they're not. But places like this, this is Itten, um, built by, designed by Guy Dorber, celebrated arts and crafts architect in a, in a, in a very much a sort of arts and crafts vernacular. Um, style. Um, Stone Village Hall, anyone who's been to Port Merion, um, Clough Williams Ellis's famous village, will instantly recognise the style here. So this is Clough Williams Ellis um, mm -hmm. at Stone in, in Buckinghamshire, a little bit of Italy down in uh, <laughs> you <know>, rural Bucks. <laughs> um, probably second only to Nettlebed is uh, St Edith's Hall in Kemsing with a grand statue of St Edith herself there, allegedly born in the village. Um, the Balcombe Village Hall with the murals by Neville Lytton, 1923, intended to express the um, um, futility of, uh, of war, a very um, frequently invoked um, sentiment, at least in, in theory, of course. Um, and Zimpington Village College, um, which just shows that um, the international modern um, could reach the Village Hall too, designed by um, Walter Gropius of Bauhaus. Um, fame, yes. Um, so there really is a bit of everything in, in the Village Hall and I think they deserve more recognition than they've really had and that it's, I'm actually talking to English Heritage about, um, about this because I do think there's a, a really significant sort of, and in terms of the social history I think they're so important and I think if you combine that with these, what I hope I've shown, some really quite varied and intriguing architectural idioms, I think there really is a case for taking them a bit more seriously from a heritage point of view than they have been. Thanks very much. Thank you.